Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to part two of the Space Planning for Small Library series. Uh, thank you for joining us today or for watching this recording. A reminder that part three is this Monday at 10 a.m., so be sure to register for next Monday if you want to invite your colleagues or board members to register and join us. My name is Shauna Kisegi. I use they or she pronouns, and I'm the Outreach and Continuing Education Consultant for the Southwest Wisconsin Library System. Um, I also have my colleague Lori here from the Bridges Library System helping today behind the scenes. If you have any questions throughout the program, please feel free to put them in the chat box. We'll be looking out for them. And today, I'm excited to welcome back John Thompson. If you didn't join us last week, I'll tell you that John has served as the IFLIS Library System Director since 2007 and has consulted on over 30 building projects in the IFLIS area. And he's provided consulting, training, and workshops for library boards and staff on a variety of library administration topics, including building projects. And he was awarded the WLA Librarian of the Year Award. And with that, I'll pass it on to John. Thanks for being here. Good morning, everybody. W welcome to the, the second of the three-part series. And today we're going to take a look at some of the alternatives for new library space. So we're going to kind of build upon um, the first week and kind of take the information that we learned about our library and put it together into something for th the next set of projects for the library. So we're going to maybe uh, take a look at how we can solve some of those um, spacious issues that we're dealing with. So uh, we'll either look at um, maybe just rearranging our current library space, um, talk about additions, remodeling, converting an existing building or brand um, building a brand new building. Uh, we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of each. Um, and then we'll just kind of focus on any questions you may have as we move forward. We'll, we'll stop in different sections. So like when we get done with the addition remodeling section, we'll see if there's any questions with that and move forward from there. Um, so we've, we have the assessment. Um, we kind of know that we need um, more space. So what do, what do we do with that? So in Wisconsin, um, libraries are need to get uh, municipal board approval to build a new building. So you have to go to your municipality and say, we'd like to um, do a new project. So obviously you want to make sure that you communicate um, your needs with the library um, board first. So my guess is if you've already done the assessment, you've already said, hey, I'm going to be doing an assessment or we're going to hire somebody to do that assessment. And here are the results. So what you want to do um, is really communicate the importance of the results of that assessment. So one of the um, things you can do, if you've hired um, or had somebody else do that report for you, you'll obviously have a print copy of that assessment. That's something you'd share with the library board. And then it's also something that you'd want to share with your municipal board. And there's a couple of ways of sharing. There's obviously you sharing the full report. Typically municipal boards um, have a lot on their plate. So you may wanna take that larger document and turn it into more of a, a slide presentation, um, looking at this is why um, we need to do something with our space. So if that's kind of the, get permission from them to, to kind of take that next step. Um, some of those next steps would be um, putting a building committee together or, um, you know, having the staff and the library board work on kind of fi figuring out what is going to be the next best alternative for solving that solution. At this point, you're probably going to want to consider hiring an architect as well. Um, that selection of an architect really is a, an, another topic, um, but we'll talk about it a little bit as we move forward with some of the different slides here. Um, so 
the decisions you have to make moving forward is, are we really looking at something that's really a short-term need? So let's say we want to add those lawn games to our collection. Um, can we weed our collection and say, okay, we're gonna shrink our print materials and then add other types of materials to our collection. That'll give us you know, that extra space. Um, do we need to maybe buy some smaller chairs, tables? Um, can we um, paint the building? Will that make it a little bit more attractable? Um, are there uh, accessibility things that we can do quickly that will make the building um, seem more attractive? Um, 30 some years ago, as a library director, the, the mantra was kind of like, you, you, people would say, well, you want to make sure it looks filled up and you want to make sure that people really know that you need the space. Well, in some respects, that's going to start turning people off from using your library. So you still want to make sure that your library is attractive. The other piece is if you, if you need to make some short term fixes, you can also then say to your municipal board, we've done everything that we can conce conceivably think of to make this space work. It's time for more space. And the alternatives may take two to three years. So you want to make sure that you're still providing the level of services that your community needs. So you may need to do some short term things just to make it um, work moving forward. Um, so, you know, if you're really looking at needing to add meeting room spaces or wanting to create um, study spaces, a lot of those areas take a lot more space than what you would have in your typical footprint of your building. You know, so if you were to try to carve out a 200 square foot meeting room, you're gonna significantly have to change your collection. So that, that's really more of a longer term need within your library. So the, again, these are the, the, the four alternatives that we're gonna take a look at. And one of the things with that, looking at your current building, you'll wanna look at, okay, again, can we weed the collection? Can we, can we maybe say, okay, it's time to get rid of our audiobook collection because everybody's streaming it. You know, a lot of cars are not being equipped with um, CD players. So is it time for that collection to, to disappear? Are there different ways that we can um, move away from those collections? For a while, um, people were carrying DVDs and VHS tapes because there might have been a, a couple of families that needed the VHS tapes. In some respects, you're probably better off just saying, we're getting rid of our VHS collection. Would you like to take and purchase some of these or can we give you some of these? that gives you that flexibility to have that space. Um, are there ways that we can rearrange the space, move the tables and chairs around um, that will make it a more workable space? So this example um, was library in Balsam Lake, um, community of about a thousand. They're in a shared municipal building and they're looking at the need for more space. And when you look at their collection, it was, it's a decent sized collection. It doesn't really have a lot of capacity to grow. The shelving that they had in their library was built by a local company. It was very well-made, um, nearly indestructible, but the base was closer to 36 to 42 inches wide. So instead of a, a standard 20, inch 24 inch double sided shelf there was an extra foot plus on those bases so that restricted how the library could feel and then they also had the children's area right up in front right next to their desk and it was all alcoved and there was no way for people really to move around there and it feel, really felt um, disconnected and then um, the carpet was worn. There's good old fashioned wood paneling in the, in there. Um, it looked tired and old. Um, so they did a little bit of, um, construction. They were able to add a wall, um, create a little bit of space, added a coffee nook, um, basically on a countertop. Um, and this is kind of what on the top shelf, 
section. This is what that new space looked like, a new paint job, new carpet, still the old shelves. Um, a few years later, it was like their outer room. They decided to shrink those shelves, um, go a little higher, and they've added capacity in their building. It's brightened it up again, um, and it's given them a little bit of room to, to make some changes. Um, the, these were all kind of short-term solutions, and, and granted, the shelving wasn't inexpensive, but they had some money set aside, so they were able to purchase that without having to go out and, and raise money for it. The advantage to this, too, is that those shelves being newer, if, if they were to go into another project, they're easy enough to move to a newer space. They're standard uh, wood shelves from a, a library manufacturer, and they're, they're easy enough to, to move forward. Um, that, that gave them enough space probably for five years. Um, right now, they're trying to figure out what's their next um, phase. They're in a building from the 60s. It's actually a pre steel construction building. So it's, um, it's, it's a shared municipal building. The uh, village hall and the police department seem to be happy in the space. Libraries run another room. So something's gonna have to happen. They've, they've maxed everything out that they conceivably can. Picture books are on taller shelves, totally inaccessible for the kids. So they've maxed collection, but they need to move forward. So that will be a longer term solution for them. So it's kind of like, we're gonna take that and start thinking about what's next. And what next might take two years to be finished. It may take 10 years. Um, there, some libraries have been discussing space for 20 years in our system. So in some cases, it's not an easy solution, but you, you gotta to continue to advocate for what's best for the community. Um, so one of the options is looking at your current building and saying, okay, can we add on to it? Can we renovate what we have and make it bigger? So what you'll need to do is say, okay, we've got land. Um, we can acquire some properties around us. Um, there, maybe it's a, a rundown residential area. It's, it would or a blighted downtown area, it's something that we can make happen. Um, the cost generally is cheaper than brand new construction, but not always. It depends on what you want to do. Um, you'll have to look at what happens with that addition. Does it add more staff costs that are longer term costs? So, you know, if, if you're going to be adding $40,000 of payroll expense, to make this work over 10 years, is that investment worth it versus doing new, new construction? Um, multiple floors in a small library, um, no, never, 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 never. Um, however, that happens. Um, you're gonna have to figure out from a customer service perspective, how you're gonna staff two floors. Um, I'm not personally a big fan of, well, the, it's, we'll put the children's area on the upper or lower floor and we'll only staff it when the kids are out of school. Well, you've got homeschool parents, you've got um, younger kids that are not in school. Um, you may have parents that are running in for um, materials during their lunch hour. How are you serving your community if that space is basically left unattended? Um, is, the, is the addition going into your parking lot? Are then you're gonna be short parking? Um, does that addition really meet your long-term needs? So we're gonna, we can add 2000 square feet on there, but we really need five to 8,000 square feet. The danger of that smaller addition is, well, you know, five years, 10 years when you're out of space, they're going to say, well, you just did a brand new building. This is a new building. How, why do you want it a new space again? So this may be your one shot of doing this. So you, you'll have to be mindful of that. 
Um, what are the ADA encoding um, requirements? Um, adding that addition on um, the accessibility between floors, accessibility between spaces, um, your restrooms, all of those different things you'll need to look at. Um, again, if you're putting a bill, an addition on, are the power lines, the gas lines buried in where you want to put that addition? If so, then you have to move them. That's an added cost to your project. And is the building worth adding on to? So it, has it been ma well maintained? Um, is it going to be an effective addition or is it just we're trying to make do with the space and we're basically have to gut the in the entire original building and rebuild from there and then depending on the type of addition um are, will there be some structural needs that you need to do in, ter in terms of you know structural steel to connect the um the roof lines how do how does that all mat match up if you're uh, working on a historic building and the addition um, especially if it's on a historic registry there are additional requirements that you have to make sure that you get approval for that addition so that you don't um, destroy the historical integrity of that original building that in some cases may add additional costs to your project or add additional time moving it forward. So all of those things are things to think about. Um, some of the pros of doing an addition or renovation is, well, everybody already knows where the library is. Assuming it's a great location, that's a plus. Um, depending on the age of the building, um, you know, if it was something that was done 20 years ago, that, or, that original investment for that building is still there. You know, if you're if look, looking at a building that's 60 to 70 years old, it's, it, there was still that investment in this, in that um, structure, but it's, you've really got your value out of those dollars. So that may be less of a reason to, to keep it. Um, but then if you're looking at a building built in the early 1900s, then you're looking at a historic building that some people um, want to preserve at any cost, and it may not be the best solution for the library. Um, again, the cost should be less than new construction, but again, it, de it depends on a lot of the conditions. So you want to think about that. Um, some of the negatives of doing an addition is depending on what the design looks like, it could reduce the flexibility of the space. So you may have support columns, um, walls that really can't move because they're structural walls. And so that limits how you can use the building. Um, if, if you're really building it on the same lot, then you, the green space that you maybe took advantage of for your programs and some of your other activities, that's gone. Uh, again, the parking lot. Um, and the biggest one is, are we going to coexist in the building while they're doing a renovation project? Or are we going to move to a different location and then move back. So th that that gets tricky because if if there's another spot that works as a library that you can just move into, why don't you just move into that? Um, that that might be a, a comment that you hear from folks. Um, I I actually uh, when I was in high school um, worked in a library where they did the renovation and kept the library open. So they were, you staged stuff. So they added the addition on, you moved everything over into the new space. And then when they renovated the old space, they rearranged everything. So it flowed, but at certain times there, they were dealing with um, dust and uh, mechanical improvements. Um, asbestos abatement and a few other things while people were still kind of in the building. So it's not ideal, but it has happened. Generally, if you're trying to coexist in the building, you're adding time and cost to your project. 
so this this is kind of an example of of a of a library um, that had an addition put on it. Um, the community had um, outstripped its library quite a bit. This was the original building. It was, I believe, thirty-ish years old. Um, shelves were maxed out. The it wasn't designed to have computers in there, so they're basically using uh, tables that they kind of pulled together. A lot of the seating went away from around tables and chairs and the, some of the lounge seating was basically sitting at the end of shelves. Um, stuff stored on top of the shelves because that's the only place they had to store it. So uh, this community, um, it's a smaller community, but it's a technically a bedroom community of the community of the Twin Cities. So it was seeing rapid population growth. Um, did a space assessment and determined that they needed, you know, eight to 12,000 square feet additional space, um, something that they couldn't necessarily um, do right away. Um, their municipality at the time had other priorities, so it was not something that they wanted to spend municipal dollars on. Um, so what they decided to do was add on um, to the space. They were able to use the green space the library had. Um, thanks to a donor, they were actually able to buy a, a property next to them. So they were able to expand and maintain parking. So there's some shots of the construction going on. Again, trying to match a bit of the roof line with the old building. Um, even though the addition was a, a much more massive structure than the original building. Um, so the top two um, pieces are actually the original library. So they turned one of the main library pieces into their big community room. The kitchen makerspace area was actually their staff work area, their director's office, and their circ desk. So none of that old stuff stayed other than the two bathrooms that were in the original building. Everything else was changed. Um, the sh two shots below are the additions to that space. Massive ceilings, um, much more wide open. Um, they have co polished concrete floors. So it gives a, a different look and feel um, to the building. Um, and then the color wise, basically use a neutral color and then used accent colors to, to make it work. Um, totally transform the structure. The exterior of the building, three sides have brick that matches the original building. The entranceway is, is more of a wood frame uh, with siding on it with the intent that they can kick that wall out and add on a next layer of addition when they, they outstrip the space here. Hopefully it won't um, be next week, but you know they're, they're envisioning it within the next five to 10 years, but it may not happen that fast. So this is the old entrance on the top. The new entrance again is that, um, much different look and feel um, and gives it a whole different image coming in from town. So literally, as you come down the hill going into the community, you can see the, the peaks of the new library. So any questions on additions and remodels? I don't see any questions yet, John. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. Okay, thank you. So one of the other options, um, which can be um, a little less than um, new construction is taking a, a building that already exists in your community and converting it into a library. Um, this presents some unique challenges um, because generally you're changing the use of the building. So that requires the building to be brought up to today's code. 
because you're changing the occupancy of the building from maybe a business to more of a, a public space. Um, so when you're looking at existing buildings, you want to see how it's constructed. Um, was it slab concrete? Um, does it have a basement, wood frame construction? Um, do you need to deal with lead paint, uh, asbestos? Um, and asbestos can be, in, if it's an older building, could be in the glue and the tile. Um, it could be in the ceiling tiles. It could be wrapped around pipes. Some of that can stay if you're not disturbing it, but once you disturb it, you have to remove it. So there, there's an extra cost to the project for that. And then you also want to look at the quality of the con initial construction. Is it still a sound building? Some of that you can do yourself. Um, other times you're going to need to bring in an architect or an engineer to assess the building um, for some of those types of things. So this is where if you're in the project mode, you may wanna already have your architect on board. Um, some of the things that I, can, I personally can kind of guess at is well, are these load bearing walls? You know, is it basically holding up your roof? Um, is the building accessible? Are there stairs going into it? Are there stairs within the building? Um, does the shape fit a library? If Can you put a library into this space and make it work? Typically a rectangle square library shape works the best, but some unique configurations work. You could do an L shape that seems to work pretty well. Um, are there stairs in the building? You know, are you dealing with two floors? Are there balconies? Um, converting a bank building, um, which we've done, a there's a couple of projects that have done that in our system area. Um, the choice then is, do you leave the bank safe in there or do you take, take it out? Moving some of that stuff out costs a lot of money but leaving it in reduces the flexibility within that space. So you, you really want to kind of look at what makes sense. So again, how old is the building? Um, what is the general condition of the, the equipment that's in there? So do you, are you going to need a new furnace? Are you going to need upgrades in plumbing? Does the roof need to be repaired? You know, some of that you can just get a gut feeling from, you know, if you see, water spots all over the ceiling, something's leaking somewhere. Um, how is the lighting? You know, is it basically four walls with lots of brick or block and no lights that then you're gonna probably have to punch in some holes to make windows, um, ceiling heights. Uh, a standard office building typically has eight foot, nine foot ceilings. Ideally in a library, you're looking at 10 foot to 12 foot ceilings because you want to have that light spread out you can make um lower ceilings work um again if you need to put a, a sprinkling system into that building for fire suppression because the building's big enough um because of code or you just want to do that then you have to be mindful that you have to have clearance between the sprinkler head and where your shelving is so if it's an eight foot ceiling, you drop it down 16 inches, then your, your ceiling is really, you know, closer to seven foot. Um, and how's that gonna mesh with your shelving? Um, your, um, again, your roof structure, does that work? Uh, floor loading for libraries requires 150 pounds per square foot. Very few things in the building code reach that. So if you, have a, if you have a basement in that structure, most likely you're not at 150 pounds per square foot. Um, some, you know, even like a bank um, that has poured concrete floors, you're, you're typically looking at 100 to 125 pounds per square feet. Um, you can get variances from the um, building code for that, but what that really requires is shorter shelves, probably 60 to 60 inch shelving and 42 to 48 inch wide aisles. So then you're spread out, um, not as much shelving capacity. 
Um, so then you're probably going to need more space. So the, that building that you thought at 8,000 square feet was going to work, you really need 10,000 square feet because you're spreading out the, the collection a little bit more. You, so you, you'll want to look at all of those kinds of things um, and, and, and see relatively, okay, how much is this going to cost in relationship to a new building that's probably going to have a little bit more flexibility. So again, you're going to look at it. Is the building in a good spot? Is there contamination on the site? So did they used to have gas tanks buried in, in, in the property at some point? Were there fuel oil tanks buried? A lot of that you hope has been remediated, but it's not always the case. Does, does the site have enough parking? Um, does, you know, does the building size work for you? What is the cost to acquire and convert that space? Um, and then just in general, when you think about it, you know, why is that building sitting empty? You know, did the, is it a bad location? You know, if it's been there for a while, is it too costly to renovate? Um, some of those kinds of things you, you, you really wanna think of. But if it's a, a blighted area, there may be grants that are available to help with the project cost, get rid of some of the contamination on the site. Um, it may be what the, the, your municipality wants to use in, as an anchor project for a, an area renovation. So there would be more apt to say, yes, this um, makes sense for us. So all of those things come into play when you look at that building. And there have been some very successful conversions of buildings um, in the libraries. The biggest concern is making sure they're as best you can find out any surprises that you might run into. Um, and that's, that's a tricky thing to know about. In, sometimes until you start ripping things apart and then that runs into um, some issues. So um, the, the example shown here is the George Culver Community Library in Sauk City. This was a historic building. Um, so they had to work with the Historic Pre Preservation Society to make sure that they maintained the integrity of this building. So at one point, this was a, a granite um, monument company. Um, so it sat on the, on the rail line, um, which now is a walking trail within Sauk City. So it's really on, on a trail. So they took that space and, and, and transformed it into a library. So some of, the, some of these pictures I took during COVID. So the shelving is not the way it would be it's like the, the, this big meeting room was kind of now a storeroom to get some of this stuff off the library. Um, but you'll notice that they had an opportunity to re-landscape, create some green areas and really keep some of that architectural feel of, of the building. Um, so this, this is kind of the inside of it. Since it was more of an industrial building they wanted to keep that look and feel for that space. It does have some balconies in there, which they converted into some smaller study rooms. They were also able to put more of a lift elevator in there. Um, they got a variance for that and were able to have that go up to a more of a, a a teen area that was in their library. But if, if you look at the light fixtures, they're more of a, that industrial look and feel. Um, if you look in, it, it might be a little hard to see on this on the slide, but in the um, bottom right, there's actually the pulley system in there that existed from the early in the building for lifting granite off of the rail car. So that stayed in the building. So that, that's a way of taking that existing building, turning it into a library, but still maintaining that integrity of the building. Um, 
This one happens to be in Prairie du Sac. Um, it's the Ruth, Ruth Culver Community Libra Library. This was had a little bit of an addition added onto it, but basically it converted um, at the, the last use of the building was Corp Culver's corporate um, headquarters. Prior to that, um, it was a restaurant and early in its life, it was an automotive dealership. So it's seen many years of life um, and it was transformed into a library. In this case, it was a two-story library. Um, the downside of that was they didn't have enough funding to staff both floors. So the desk that was created downstairs at the very beginning, it opened up, had a sign. If you need help, go upstairs. Not great customer service. Um, but sometimes that's the reality of the space. Um, what was nice about this building is it sits right on the Wisconsin River. So they were able to take advantage of this, the scenery um, and really built a, a library that um, met the needs of the community at the time. Again, some of these areas are growing faster and there may need to be some additions to it, but this was designed again to have an addition put on it. Um, St. Croix Falls was actually an old grocery store that sat abandoned for a number of years. Um, they, they decided to keep more of, uh, of an industrial feel to it, um, put in the polished concrete floors, left the ceilings open, um, and then had to add in some acoustic tiles. Those are what the gray things are hanging from the ceiling. So that kind of deadens the sound within that building. So sometimes when you move in, you have to make adjustments to it. This was one of those buildings that they were able to take advantage of some um, funding for blight um, and really make some changes to, to that space. And, and it's actually kind of a, a co-op building on, there's a little corner where a dentist office is in there, they're sharing the space. So it's a public, kind of a public private um, partnership there. So this, this is going to be, the next few slides are kind of a, a, a uh, going back to, you have to have permission from your municipality for a building project. Um, Sometimes when you're talking about needing space, your municipality decides that they need space too, or they just randomly decide that they need space and figure the library is a great anchor because um, we can get grants for libraries. We can't get grants for city hall. Um, so in Amory, they decided that they um, wanted to centralize city hall, the police department and the library into one location. Um, the library and the police department we're already in separate spaces in a condo building. Um, the library had been in there since 2008, so it's relatively new space. They had 22,000 square feet on two floors. The lower level was basically storage, a, a pretty decent size um, friends book sale storage room, um, place for the historical society to have their displays. So they were, basically having tenants in their lower level. Um, at the time, there was a need to fix the roof and HVAC system and some other items. And since they were in a condo building, the city share was gonna be about $2.1 million. City Hall was in a non-accessible building um, that was having issues. So they decided to purchase a multi-story bank building um, really without any formal assessment of what the city departments needed. Um, the building itself was constructed in 1966 and had a uh, renovation and expansion in 1982. Um, after some assistance from library folks, they did do an assessment of the building um, and deemed the cost to be a couple million dollars to renovate it and turn it into a library. These are a couple of shots of what the old library looked like um, that they were moving out of. So the, the one was um, their children's literacy activity area 
pretty wide open spaces. Um, it was an old medical clinic, so there's a lot of walls in the way that were structural. So again, some of that space was not as um, flexible as it could have been in a different building. <coughs> so they moved forward with the project. Some of the concerns expressed was that the city was driving the project and library um, leadership wasn't necessarily involved in all of the decision making. The um, building was actually three floors, a lower level basement, a main level, and then a, a mezzanine level. The city hall indicated that they wanted their offices on the main level, um, which then resulted in the library needing to be split between two floors. The lower level had eight foot ceilings, um, and it was also in two different levels. So there was a ramp going up there. Um, the, the space also decreased all of the, the tenant spaces. In fact, the Historical Society completely had to move out of the building and the friends went into a much reduced space. Um, the, as you move, they move forward with the project, um, there are already seven existing sump pumps in the space. There was water that you could see coming through the, the cement block walls. Um, when they went to do some work, they removed some wallpaper that originally had been intended to stay as part of the remodel to save costs, discovered there was mold behind there. All of that drywall had to come out and they remediated all the mold and they tried to rectify why the wall was leaking. Um, then the, some of the spaces that originally were potential library spaces were turned into server rooms and city storage in the lower level where the library was. So again, it reduced some of their space. Without having a concept of everything involved, the project budget didn't include money for new shelving and furniture. The original shelving was homemade and custom fit for all the nooks and crannies in the old space. This is kind of what it looked like um, outside and some of the remodeling going on. Uh, the one picture on the lower right is the mold um, that was discovered. That All that drywall is gone now. Um, so again, they're working with uh, poured concrete floors. So any extrusion going up, they had to drill down to get um, electrical in through the floors and different things like that. Um, having said all of that, it's now a very beautiful uh, renovated space. They have access to a much larger meeting room. They have a much larger staff workroom. They actually have multiple study spaces. They have um, a maker space story time area. Um, the shelving was cobbled together. Some of it didn't survive the move. Um, concern would be, you know, spring thaw is the, the water going to be okay because this project was done in winter. Um, and the entire building was 25,000 square feet. Um, the library's annual report space is now about 15,000 square feet. So it's a, a reduction in space um, dedicated strictly to the library, but some of the other stuff is outside of the library. So they'll have to see how it goes. Um, right now, the estimated cost is somewhere between four to $5 million. So it doesn't, doesn't mean it's necessarily cheaper. Um, and the, there are some of the pictures of what the space looks like. So if you look at the uh, lower left and the upper left, those are actually the spaces where the mold was. Um, and then the, the lower right hand is now their uh, activity literacy area, much smaller space. Um, but it, but it, it does work. Some of these pictures were literally taken the days they were moving in. So 
Um, it's relatively a uh, new project, um, but it, it, it has turned out um, fairly well for the community. Hey, John, we have a question. Yep. yep. Um, is there a resource you could point to about the grants you mentioned? Is there a good place to find those? Um, next week's topic, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so Wisconsin has, uh, there's a community block grant program that's administered through the Department of Administration. So there's a, a public facilities um, component, but there, there's also one that deals with blighted areas um, and there are different requirements for them. Um, so yeah, if you go look on the um, Department of Administration site, they're, they're technically federal dollars that the state man manages. So um, they have different criteria. That criteria changes every year. So some of them you know, work, may work one year and not the next. So um, they're out there that way. Thanks. All right, any other questions, Shauna, before we jump into new construction? Um, all there was was um, a question about recommended architects um, okay. in Wisconsin, and I sent the South Central list of our architects that are have worked on library design in Wisconsin. Yep, yeah, and I'll just follow up on that too. Um, the list of firms that have done library projects, what you wanna be careful of is that the staff that's available at those firms actually have worked on library projects. So you're, hire, you're hiring a project architect and not a firm. So when a firm says they've done 10 libraries, the architect that will be doing your project may have never designed a library. So you want to make sure you find both when you hire an architect, the architect that's done a project and a firm that's done a project. Um, so that, that's a, a, a key um, component to that. Um, moving into new um, construction, um, depending on the size that you need and then the other conditions within your municipality, um, you may, for political reasons, decide that you want to do a shared municipal building. So you may want to put the a city hall, police department, or community center, or, or some other municipal functions in with the library. One of the benefits for that is that you can share a meeting room. So if you want to have a space where you can have 50 to 100 kids in there for a program, you'll have that space. The, the municipality can use it for elections so they can put up their polling sp space in there. A community center, they could do senior meals there um, or they could rent it out on the weekends for other community activities, depending on how it's designed. So maybe that they, they, they're okay with it for birthday parties or family reunions and things like that. It kind of depends on what the community is okay with and how the building's designed to make sure that it, it works. Um, so again, new construction, you tend to design it so it's flexible, meets the needs of the library today, and then the library in 20 years. Um, the cost typically um, can vary, but you know, 250 to $400 a square foot is not uncommon for library construction. Um, so that, you know, a 10,000 build, 10,000 square foot building is going to cost you $2.5 million plus architect fees, plus the cost to buy the land, plus the cost to furnish the building. So you know, you may be in, you know, maybe market wise, you might be able to get in a little closer to 2 million. Um, but be mindful that it's, it's going to be expensive. Um, but again, it's a building you're building to last for 20 to 40 years. And the other options, you're already working on a structure that's already old um, or older trying to find the right site for your building. So again, you want something that's visible. You want something that's big enough to build the library and have a parking lot, plus have green space and then room to expand. Because again, if your community all of a sudden starts you know, increasing in population, 
you're going to want to be able to maximize that investment and build on to it. Again, this is this may be your one shot for the next 40 years because everybody's going to remember that library as we just built a new library, even though it's 20, 30, 40 years old and the community's completely changed, but you have to use that mindset there. Um, and then getting back to hiring that architect, um, you want to make sure that they're able to communicate the style of building that fits your needs as well as fits the, the site and the community. So you don't want a, a large overpowering building that's sitting in a residential area. You want it to complement the residential area. If you're in a transitional area between residential and commercial, again, it's, it's one of those barrier buildings that you can say, okay, we can make it feel less commercial and make it feel more residential, but still be a little bit more commercial to kind of blend the two areas together. Um, is it going to be in the center of what the town is today or is it going to be on the edge of town um where um the the community might be growing in 10 to 15 years so you know some libraries have been built out in, the, in what you know might be considered the cornfield um and then you go back 20 years later and it's completely surrounded with development and I, you know sun prairie um is a good example that the library was out on the edge of town and now it's no longer the edge of town so you know obviously that's a much bigger community but that those types of things do happen um and again if you're going to site that new building where are those trends going you know are you going to be closer to the highways that intersect your community traffic patterns where there's already new development all of those kinds of things come into play um, generally um, architects will site the building on the location so that it takes advantage of natural lighting um, the resources that are available to make that building more energy efficient without necessarily having it be a LEED certified building. They're all designing for green. They're all trying to maximize efficiency. They're all code requirements to make that efficiency happen. Um, so it's going to be designed that way, but sometimes the site works best. Um, if your site has uneven topography, so it you know, sits on a hill, but the lower part, um, needs to be infilled or you build a building so that it fits two levels all of those things are, are things to think about when you're looking at the site um, generally they're going to be higher cost than the other options um, the danger of shared facilities um, can be that especially if the municipality is the one driving the, the project the library needs may be scaled back to meet the needs of other more vocal individuals. So you'll want to make sure when you're advocating for a, a shared space that everybody's working with the same vision, um, are not worried at the beginning planning stages of how much this is going to cost because you want it to be designed to meet the needs of everybody that would be your first kick at the tires in terms of that space but when it you may have to make some compromises and so what what are acceptable compromises to make without impacting negatively your services that you want to provide um, looking at spaces like okay should we have a, a dedicated story time space just in the library so that we know we will always have that space and we're not competing with municipal board meetings or other entities for that space. But again, if you're only doing story time two times a week or one time a week, that space is sitting empty. So then is it designed to be a quiet study space, uh, maybe a, 
a small conference room, maybe your maker space, it, or, or can you put doors in there that you can just kick it wide open and, and it just becomes seating space in the library. All of those things are, are things you need to think about when you're in that new construction phase of the building. Hey, John. Yeah. Um, someone asks, um, earlier you mentioned a space needs assessment. Do you recommend that a director do this or someone else with fresh eyes? Um, it can be done either way. Um, it just depends on what you perceive as the credibility that you have as a, as a library director or the cre credibility that an outsider might have in influencing the village board. So if they feel that this is just your pipe dream of a project and you're the only one pushing it and you're your report is is slanted towards the library, um, then you're probably better off hiring somebody to do that assessment for you. And again, that level of assessment could be strictly some space needs going through that um, space planning outline and then just doing some focus groups with um, community and staff to just kind of like, what do we want in our new library? And then that process is there, but you know, again, you could do it yourself or you could hire somebody to do it. Um, it's just community. It's what you think is gonna work better in your community. Thank you. We also have, what about design build where there is more flexibility for designing? Design build is not allowable for public construction projects in Wisconsin. So they, it needs to be a, a low bid project um, typically design bid is that you hire a contractor, they design it and build it. And that's not allowable for public projects. Thank you, that's it. All right. So um, the slide here is an example of new construction um, that is actually a shared municipal building um, in Glenwood City. Um, so, the, the library before was in a um, old church building in a residential part of town. Um, quite frankly, nobody knew where it was. There was some road signage, but if you didn't know the library was down the road, you didn't know the library was in town. Um, this building happens to be on Main Street. This is a project that was driven by the administrator of the community. Library board did not have much involvement. Their director, they were absent a director at the time. So there was not uh, li library leadership during the development of some of the, the plans. Um, so what, what happened is the, um, the space for city hall, the community center and the police department kind of began to shrink the library space. Um, it's much more attractive than their old library. The old library had multiple floors with they, basically the basement was a, a giant storage area. There's very limited storage in the space for the library. There's two storage closets. The community room has cabinetry in it, but that doesn't store your, your hula hoops, your pool, all those things that you might wanna do for summer those big things are not items you put in storage cabinets. Um, the, the, so the colors and some of, even some of that was decided by a designer, not really with the input of, of the library board. Um, it's a little hard to see, but um, in the upper left corner, th this is kind of the entrance into the building at the edge of the building right here is where the book drop is for an exterior book drop. If you'll notice, it's probably two and a half feet up um, into the, in the building. And you'll, no, you'll notice there's some block here for the, the piece. Basically, the architect, again, the, the company has done projects. The architect, I don't believe actually has ever done a library. The book drop is the size of a 
medium size um, Rubbermaid tote. It's not a large tote. It's, it's so it, it probably maybe on a good day would hold 40 picture books and 10 adult fiction books. Um, there's no door on it right now. So it's, it's worthless um, to be blunt. Um, but the, the architect didn't follow up with anybody. So it, it's kind of wh where it is. Um, this is some of the seating in, in, the, in that space. Um, the two lower parts are the um, kitchen and kind of the community space. So the library can use this for programming, but the kitchen was really designed for senior meals as well as people coming in and doing um, birthday parties, family reunions and that because they replaced their community center um, building with a room within the municipal building. So another example is Colby. This is a, a standalone library. Um, it has lots of green space, uh, metal roof, um, and different um, activity areas. You'll notice you, as you walk in, a big wide opening, uh, lots of wood shelving, uh, lots of wood to, to kind of really make the building feel warm. But then the other space is more of a story time maker space space. Um, a little bit more of a um, commercial feel to it um, with some flexibility, vinyl flooring, um, just so that, again, you can have that flexibility of space within that building. Um, Abbotsford is, is another example of a shared municipal building. It looks like a kind of like a tr train depot. Um, it literally sits, you know, 100 feet from uh, railroad tracks. So it kind of replicates what an old depot would have looked like in Abbotsford. Again, using some of the wood, um, different tone of wood gives it a little richness to it. Um, but uh, the interior is a little bit more modern um, in terms of the signage and some of the lighting. Um, so just different looks and feels that are possible. Um, Roberts, this is a slightly older project. Um, this is one of those um, cautionary tales. Um, their community um, purchased the lot to build the library um, and had an, an architect come up with the concept of the exterior of the building as part of their fundraising pack project. The building was 10 to 15 years in the making after they had the lot purchased. During that period of time, the population of the community almost doubled. So it, the building itself was built too small just because the community had changed so much. But that was the space they had, um, and, and that's what the, the library board at the time was very adamant that we want to keep the design that we had we want to keep it the same size and this is what we want to do um the the architect that was on this project had never does designed a library before um and really didn't understand having that flexible space um but they were able to at least influence some of the decision making in terms of how the building was laid out um, Lots of glass, wide open windows, um, good high ceilings, uh, turned out really well. Um, but at some point, probably in the next five years or so, they're going to have to look at um, trying to maybe expand it. And if, if you'll notice, the building has some unique shapes to it. That makes putting additions onto it a little bit more difficult. The meeting room, though, hat is squared off. So that's something that they could expand into and then go go into the parking lot for the addition, but then you have to be careful of that. The other piece is this project was designed with geothermal in it. So the, the, that field is out in front of the building. So you have to be careful about disturbing that um, for your heating system. So kind of to wrap it up, you know, make sure you're sharing your, your needs with your stakeholders, look at big pictures, um, really focus on um, 
criteria for evaluating those options. So, you know, what are the pros and cons of all the various options? Have meetings with the community, share your vision, get feedback from the community on that vision and, and really move forward. Because there's going to be differences of, of opinions in the community. Um, if you're in an older building that people are attached to, that's going to be a tougher sell than maybe if the building's 1960-ish, 70-ish um, architectural style, there's less, people are less in love with that building than something from the you know, 1920s, just because of the, the quality and style of architecture that existed. Um, so you, those are all, all of the, those pieces that you have to th um, think about and really be mindful of. And if you have any questions, again, um, we, I, th we're, I think we ran a little bit over today, um, but you know, I can stick around and answer any questions. Otherwise, if you um, have things that you think of afterwards, um, feel free to get a hold of me. Thank you, John, for being here and everyone for your questions. Um, we look forward to seeing you all next week for our final program in this series. And we hope you have a good rest of your day. If you want to send any questions that were answered, feel free again to send them to John or myself, and I'll make sure John gets them. Okay, thank you.